today on Bridges, we'll have an inspirational story of how one man turned fear, poverty, prejudice, and persecution into love and healing for others. Schmelter, I'm glad that you could join us today for Bridges. My guest today is Dr. Ming Wang. And Dr. Wang, it's good to have you. Good to see you again, Monica. I'm excited about your new book, From Darkness to Sight, A Journey from Hardship to Healing. Uh, I know that you're very busy, you know, as a world-renowned laser eye surgeon. What made you decide to write this book now? I want to write my autobiography because I want to encourage young people in America today to work harder in schools by appreciating more what they have in America today. And, you know, kids have so many stuff. They have iPhone, iPad, and the, the human nature is that when you have lots of things, you kind of can take things for granted yes. and not appreciating as much. By reading this book, to feel the pain of suffering uh, of another youngster who, at their age, who has so much less, who has suffered so much more, and I hope will make today's students uh, in America today uh, by comparison and truly appreciate what they have and treasure it and work harder in schools. Yes, and that is a wonderful goal. And I would love for you, as you do in your book, From Darkness to Sight, share with us when you talk about the suffering as a youngster. You really went through a lot. I mean, you faced deportation, uh, a life of hardship. Kind of describe that, if you would, and how that motivated you to work hard. You know, I grew up in a city near Shanghai, China. I was born in 1960s. In 1966, I was six years old, and uh, my mom's a teacher. Uh, dad is a family doctor. I have a younger brother, and the whole family was fo focused on education, mm -hmm. and education was everything. In 1966, the communist dictator in China decided the best way to keep on dictating is to keep people ignorant. Mm. The best way to keep people ignorant is actually dis to destroy the education of all the young people of the entire nation. Mm. So in 1966, they started what they call Cultural Revolution, and they shut down all universities and colleges of the entire country, China, and forcefully deported every single high school graduate to the poorest part of the country and condemned each one of us a life sentence of hard labor and poverty. So 1974, I was 14 years old. I finished my ninth grade. I was a stray student. I was working really hard mm -hmm. when the deportation order came down to me, and I was supposed to be gone, the next person. So you were facing deportation. Yes. I got kicked out of school after ninth grade, and I couldn't go on. And I faced with this devastating fate of deportation and life sentence of hard labor. In order to avoid that, I start picking up a Chinese violin, a music instrument to play, and start learning dancing. Because if you can play an instrument, or if you can dance, you might be able to get into what they call communist song and dance propaganda troupe. If you can get into that, you might be able to avoid deportation life sentence and be allowed to stay in the city. So I was playing the instrument every day. I remember I was playing the song written by a blind artist, uh, resonating with his sad feeling. He couldn't see physically. Mm -hmm. I could not see mentally any future. Then the communist government discovered that I was studying music instrument and dancing for an, with an ulterior motive, really not for music or dancing per se, but to avoid deportation and labor mm -hmm. camp. So they stopped my music and dancing. You know, to put into perspective, these days in America, sometimes friends will come and say, oh, Ming, so nice, you're a doctor, and you can also dance, you can play an instrument. It's nice to have these hobbies. And I always say, I didn't learn these as hobbies. I learned to survive. Yeah. So I did everything. My fate, still, fate was still deportation, life sentence. And then 1976, 10 years into Cultural Revolution, from 1966 to 1976, the communist dictator died in China. So China woke up. They stopped Cultural Revolution and reopened all the universities, first time in 10 years. Wow. And uh, so my mom and dad came home and said, Ming, you might, be able to go to, Ming, you might be able to go to college one day. I thought I'd never be able to hear that in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. How did that feel to you as a youngster? You had so many really 
horrific things around you, like yeah. not a lot to look forward right. to. Yes. I think it even just had to take a lot of motivation to even make the decision to want to play the Chinese violin and to dance. Like you were still trying to do something, yes. even though everything was dark all around you. Yes, it was really living in the darkness, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, with no future. And uh, as I said, I was playing the music written by this blind artist. He couldn't see physically, I could not see mentally resonating with his sad feeling. As a 14-year-old who had no future. It's interesting that decades later now, sometimes friends come and talk to me and say, oh, Ming, why you decided to devote your life to help people see and to help the blind, who people who are suffering? And I think it may has to do with my experience then, you know, mm. that um, I was emotionally connected to a blind person at the lowest point in my lifetime. And, got an education cut off and faced with this labor camp deportation. So I want to help people today when I see a patient who is blind, who is suffering, because I used to suffer. Yes. So you really took all of those things that went on for you as a youngster, like fear yes. and poverty and just prejudice, just oppression, and you really let those things work in your heart, in your life, to point you to bring healing yes. and to show love to other people. Yes. When your parents tell you about this news that you might be able to go to college someday, were you excited, scared, or a blend of it? Because I would think if you got kicked out of school at the ninth grade, yeah. you might think, well, can I do it now? Right. Am I going to be ready? Will it be OK? Yes, I got kicked out of school at age 14 after ninth grade. And then I was 17 um, when the universities were all reopened up, first time in 10 years. And uh, so I, I asked my parents, I said, should I go back to ninth grade? Because I was dropped out of school in <laughs> yeah. three years. And mom and dad said, no, you go jump straight to 12th grade overnight. And I said, why? And mom said, only 12th graders are allowed to participate in the college entrance exam. I said, that's impossible. And they said, we're going to help you. So mom and dad, you know, they day and night, they copy those exams, and they're trying to help me. And they drill me really hard. like forced me to study 19, 20, 21 hours a day. But fortunately, wow. I listened to them. Mm -hmm. So I did get into college, but I did not want to have anything to do with the communist dictators anymore. I've suffered enough from 14, age 14 to age 17. So 1982, with $50 for bottle from a visiting American professor, with enough money gathered together from relatives for one-way airplane ticket. I didn't even have money to go come yeah. go back if it didn't work out. <laughs> with a student visa, I was dropped out National Airport, Washington, D.C. With that $50, with a Chinese English dictionary, knowing no one in this country. This is what I was going to ask you. Did you know someone that you were going to no. go visit once no. you got here or have housing arranged? No. You came here with $50, $50 knowing yeah. nobody? Knowing nobody and could hardly speak English, but with a big American dream. Mm -hmm. Because I've suffered so much, I appreciate it. Yeah. so much the freedom and the opportunity to be able to have education. And I had good fortune attending some of the wonderful schools in this country, but it is America, a country that have given me the opportunity mm -hmm. to study and become a doctor. And as an immigrant, I feel particularly that I'm so grateful. And I tell all my immigrant friends these days that we have all chosen to live here and we need to help America. We need to pay back and contribute. Mm -hmm. Because of the American dream, because yes. of the freedom, because of the hope that it yes. brought you. When you got here with the $50 and nobody, what, what did you do at first? And I know you chronicle that in your book, mm -hmm. and the book is From Darkness to Sight by Dr. Ming Wang. I mean, how do you start? Because some people would say, well, but you've, you've been poor, you've been persecuted, people have shown prejudice against you. How did you have the courage to go out and, and apply to schools here and, and make your way? Yes, it was funny because I had $50, but I had to get some uh, clothing. It only came with one set of clothes. And um, I budgeted $30 for my clothing, and I only spent $10 because I went to Salvation Army and got a whole trash bag of used clothes. <laughs> and I thought I could be Americans again. I put them on next day and got lots of people laughing at me because all the clothes I got from Salvation Army were at least 15 years older. So these were bell-bottom pants, and <laughs> takiyaki pattern shirts. And people said, you so to become style. a yuppie. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> but that was all I could afford. Sure. And um, I had to learn the language quickly. And I, I realized that it's not just about learning the language. It's also about learning the culture. Right. And I found the best way is to watch movies. 
So I got found this little rundown theater in Washington, D.C. that they would show two feature films every night for one dollar. <laughs> and I kept on watching movies. And about six months or so, I learned the language quickly through watching movies. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. That's amazing. So you said that one of your goals with writing this book, From Darkness to Sight, is to really help young Americans and students to yes. appreciate all of the things that we have here in America. What are some of the takeaways that you hope that they will get from yes. your book? Yes, and there are several takeaways. You know, one is um, at the end of the Cultural Revolution, there, there was this opportunity to go to school, and uh, my parents presented to me this nearly impossible task. I was very stressed out, and it was very easy to back down, sure. not to fight, but I knew that I did not want to return to the dark days, darkness. So I listened, fortunately, I listened to my parents and uh, studied. They drove me 19, 20, 21 hours a day. Almost killed myself studying. And now I benefit. So I always tell young students today, love and listen to your parents. Amen. They have your best interests in mm -hmm. their hearts. They have been there. They have done that. And they love you. That's right. And. Uh, you know, listen to them and respect them. And um, fortunately, I did. Yes, you and, did. And um, I benefited. As my parents got older, you know, I, I wanted to help them. So several years ago, I moved both of my parents to, to move in, to live with me for the rest of their lives. <laughs> I want to take care of them uh, in their sunset years. I feel that when a person gets older, the best thing could happen is to have children around. You know? Yeah. So that's one takeaway for students today is respect your parents, love them, they have been there, done that, they have suffered, they have your best interest in heart. And second thing um, I always tell students is that, you know, at the end of the Cultural Revolution, when opportunity came, that was impossible to jump three years ahead. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, I listened and I worked hard and fought for it. And uh, now I have future. Mm -hmm. I always tell students that when opportunities come in life, don't squander it because it may not come again. That's right. You know? And lastly, you know, uh, lots of kids today, when they have in, tr in trouble, they say, oh, it's not my fault, uh, it's my parents' fault, it's not my fault, it's my teacher's fault, or it's not my fault because I was born in the bad situation. Mm -hmm. It's everybody else's fault except his or her own. Right. And I hope through my book, From Darkness to Sight, uh, that letting the youngsters read the book, this is not uh, fiction, this is a real life story yes. that what I've gone through. Your real life story, yes. yes. To feel the pain and suffering of another youngster who at their age had suffered so much at age 14, was thrown out of school, losing all hope for any further education, and faced with this devastating fate of deportation and life sentence to have to have mu play music, learning dancing, or to avoid deportation. And fought against that, came to this country with only $50, who could still make it. Little Johnny should be able to make it. Absolutely. Don't be lazy. <laughs> Get up in the morning, work harder, and pull up your grades. Johnny should realize that he has the freedom Yes. to go to school, to get an education. A freedom that was not available to me in right. Communist China during the Cultural Revolution. A freedom that is still not available in so much parts of the world, even today. Absolutely. We are blessed here. We've got to take a break. We want you to stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk to Dr. Ming Wang some more about his book, From Darkness to Sight. You can purchase a copy of today's show for $15. Call us at 615-754-0039 or send a check to the address on the screen. Please mention the program number on the screen. The blood of Christ is the only cure. It gets down to the root of every single thing that ails us. There's not an addiction, there's not a generational curse, there's not any root of sin, there's nothing that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse. Visit monicaschmelter.com to schedule Monica to speak at your event. When I truly turned my heart to the Lord, He took every sin I ever did away from me. God really is your other half. God, yeah. He's the only person who can really, you know, fill those holes and cracks in your heart that you're so wanting someone to fill. It's no good to have a big dream if you're not putting yourself in motion to yeah. go after that. If you're just joining us today on Bridges, my guest is Dr. Ming Wang. We're taking a look into his book called From Darkness to Sight, which is his true life story of a journey from hardship to healing. And, you know, Dr. Wang, we've been talking about many things and really how you suffered so much as a youngster, and yet you worked hard anyway. 
and were able eventually to come to America and achieve so much. And that's so much of your message, you know, to students now. But, you know, I have to ask you, you know, as a, as a medical doctor, like now you're a Christian and you're a believer, what was that journey of faith like for you? I was born as an atheist. And I believe only in science. All I wanted to study was science during Cultural Revolution in China. Finally, I made my way to America, and I got the opportunity to study. So I just want to study science and nothing else. Mm -hmm. You know, the movie God's Not Dead. And in that movie, there's a cute little Chinese student who rode a little bicycle into American campus, yes. and that was me. That was you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, so I just wanted to study science. I was gung-ho atheist. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was in medical school that I met a professor because I started studying human eye structure and found it so complicated. And uh, based on atheist belief that the eye w would evolve out of random, and I found it's impossible. Hmm. So I was in crisis that how could science explain such mm -hmm. a complicated structure as a human eye could form in such a short period of time. So you're saying as a scientist mm -hmm. and as an atheist, right. the more that you studied the human eye and yes. how complex it is, yes. it really kind of spurred you to think, yes. how could something this complex yes. happen that quickly? Yes. So that professor took me out for lunch one day, and he said, Ming, what's a cross street? I said, that's a car. He <laughs> said, what's the big difference between a car and a human brain? Mm -hmm. And I said, human brain is a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. And he said, OK. Can you imagine a pile of a random piece of metal assemble itself into a car? Mm -hmm. I said, oh, no way. <laughs> he said, how about human brain? So right then and then, he opened a window in my life, and um, he said, the reason why human eyes structures as complicated as human eye can form in such a short period of time is because it did not form out of randomness. It was formed with a specific purpose for vision. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a creator behind it all. So he gave me my first Bible, and he opened a window in my life to Christian faith mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ. So did you become a Christian yes. right that moment? Yes. Yes, and I've since, you know, continued in my journey to walk with sure. Christ and to learn. And as a scientist, you know, in today's society, we're faced with many challenges. One of them is as science keeps on developing, it sometimes clashes with moral, ethical, faith principles. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the diseases I study a lot is elderly disease in the eye, you know, diabetes, glaucoma, macular degeneration. And in order to treat these aging diseases, you have to use young tissue fetus. But as a Christian then, I did not want to hurt the baby to benefit adult. Yes. At the same time, I want to do research to help my elderly patients to treat their diabetes, glaucoma, and macular degeneration. So what should we do? And, um, you know, James 1.4 in the Bible says that perseverance will complete you and mature you. So I fortunately persisted. I didn't give up. I believe that God will have a plan for us, even though it was not clear what it was. Sure. I persisted, which you talked about in my biography from Darkness to Sight, for nearly 20 years. I didn't give That's up. That's a lot of persistence, uh, no, 20 years. Yes, I kept on uh, researching, trying to find to help elderly patients without hurting the baby. And finally, we came up across the placenta that, you know, that the baby came from the placenta, the amniotic sac. After the baby is born, the placenta and amniotic sac is collapsed and discarded. So I recovered those placenta back in the laboratory and bioengineered the amniotic membrane that each baby sits in before birth into amniotic contact lenses, put these youthful, youthful healing placenta amniotic contact lenses on older patients' eyes so their eyes can heal like a baby. So it's a way to do fetal research without touching the baby. Mm. And I truly believe God loves us. He wants us to improve the quality of lives. Mm. And the quality of lives is improved through research. But he wants us to do it in the right way. Mm. Sometimes science and faith and moral ethical f principles clash and the solution may not be obvious, but does not mean the solution is not there. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would say the ultimate test as a Christian is when things are not obvious, when things are not going well, can we maintain our trust and confidence in God that God will show his way at the right time. Mm -hmm. but we do need to be persistent and we do need to do our homework. Yeah. And that goes back to really what you were even talking about as a, as a young person, 
that persistence, that yes. perseverance, even though in China at that time that your life was really, your future was dark, like yeah. you couldn't see it, but you persisted doing what you knew to do, to study, to work hard, even yes. the dance and the music. And you're saying now, even as someone who's gone from being an atheist to being a believer, that as a doctor, you you really live the word of God and you just say, okay, maybe I don't see this, but I'm gonna keep, I'm only gonna do the right thing and I'm going to keep studying and persisting until God shows me. Yes, we all say as a scientist that, you know, research. Research to me is a re-search. Right. Research and identify part of the glory of God's original creation. Uh, I didn't invent the placenta amniotic membrane, God did, but he gave us the opportunity to discover that and to use for the benefit of our patients. And so if we don't give up, if we maintain confidence, then I believe that God has a solution to difficult problems in our lives, such as the clash between science and faith, you know, there, there will be a way. Mm -hmm. Science and faith are friends are not false. You know, to me, I think life, you know, science and faith is like this, the two sides of the same coin. You know, science and faith. Science is about what things are and faith is about why things are. Mm -hmm. And today's students, you know, when they study science and technology, study computer technology or uh, engineering, and they say, oh, I just study hard, I don't need to know Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I always say, based on my life experience, from atheist to believer and through persistent and studying, eventually see a bit of God's glory in this amniotic contact lens invention. And I always tell students that, yes, you can be a good scientist, you can be a good engineer, good mathematician if you work harder but you can be a better one mm -hmm. if you also know Jesus Christ. Absolutely, absolutely. We're talking today about this book, From Darkness to Sight, and this is Dr. Ming Wang's personal story of his life, his journey from living in China, facing deportation, a lot of hardship to now, being a Christian believer and a world-renowned laser eye surgeon. And so really those things that you learned as a young person have served you well as a doctor, and I know that sometimes, Dr. Wang, a lot of people, even in Christianity, even the people that aren't doctors, will hit a bump in the road with their faith and say, well, I don't know how that works, so I don't believe in God. And you're saying if we'll just continue to study, the solution may not be obvious or the answer may not be, but God will be faithful to show us. Yes, keep on praying, mm -hmm. keep on persisting, keep on, walk with, keep on walking with God, because at the end of the day when we pray and we may or may not get what we want, but mm -hmm. at the end is what God wants matters. Right. You know, and uh, that God will answer our prayer, you know, in His way at His time, you That's know. Right. And we have a China Bible project now mm -hmm. that we bring uh, the Bible that have Chinese, have English to China because China economically is growing so fast and people no longer believe in communism anymore, but they need to believe in something. Yes. So it's, um, <laughs> Presidented spiritual vacuum. And we have the China Bible Project we bring to China, get from recipient an email address. And we disperse this email address to the Christian brothers and sisters here. So any one of us have the opportunity through pen pal, one on one, can nurture, support, fellowship one of the budding Christians over there who have received one of our Bibles. Because 95% of the 1.4 billion people in China are not Christians. So this project, the China Bible Project, has the potential to recruit for God's kingdom quarter of human race. That's amazing. Did you come up with the China Bible yes. Project? God showed you to do that? It's been going around about 10 years now. 10 years now. So how does it work? How can people help with that? Well, um, they uh, first of all, they contact us at uh, www.wangfoundation.com to register to be a pen pal. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we get those email addresses, and then we give those email addresses to Christian brothers and sisters here. And this email address corresponds to folks who are in China who have received one of our Bibles, mm -hmm. half English, half Chinese. But receiving the Bible is just the very first step Absolutely. of a 10,000-mile journey. You know, you can't just go to church one time and become Christian. It requires continued uh, fellowship with God and continued nurture and study mm -hmm. and uh, you know, strengthening of one's faith. So we're hoping through this pen pal project that each one of us can one-on-one -on -one email pen pal with a budding Christian over there who have received our Bibles, that we can help 
that person, that budding Christian, grow in his or her faith in an environment which is uh, which is hostile because they are yeah. not Christians. Well, the, uh, when you say people. hostile, you're saying that because so many people are not are Christians. Not Christians exactly. So it's not like living around here That's where right. there are lots of Christians and it's That's a more right. affirming environment. Yes. What about for you, and I know you share your journey here in this book, From Darkness to Sight by Dr. Ming Wang, in your, in your practice, in your medical practice, and you are serving patients and bringing good. Are they surprised to find that you're a Christian and how you found that faith and science actually go together? Yeah, it's a good question. That you know, having eye surgery is one of the most apprehensive experiences yes. in one's life. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, a patient's dying there, so, oh, Dr. Wang, you're going to cut into my eyeball, yeah. you know. And it's a very apprehensive experience. No matter how successful I have been, I've done about 55,000 procedures, including over 4,000 doctors. Wow. But for that patient, right there, mm -hmm. it's 100%. That's right. Everything. So this is what I do. Every time before surgery, I try to put myself in patient's shoes to realize that this is 100%. They're nervous, mm -hmm. you know, and they never had this done before. And, uh, you know, all the operating room, you know, the nurses walking around, that's what I do. I walk in the operating room, clear the room, and I grab a chair and sit by the patient, and we pray. Mm -hmm. And praying does two things for me. Number one, help me slow down. Yes. Because, you know, today the doctors are so busy running around. When you rush, one can make a mistake. That's right. And you don't want to make mistake on somebody's eyes for the vision of his or her life. So praying helped me slow down, double, triple check all the machine, knowing this is somebody's life, that the vision for the rest of his or her life mm -hmm. is on the line. Second reason I pray is because sometimes as human beings, you know, are we master this technology, science, we think no, we know everything. And we get big-headed, pompous, mm -hmm. then we can make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Praying remind me that no matter how much we have done as human beings, compare what God has done for right. us is nothing. So there's no need to be pompous or big-headed. Be modest, be humble, double, triple check all the machines, remember some of these visions on the line, and be humble and just f do all the basic, do it right, mm -hmm. be patient. So I pray with all my patients, and um, I, I, it helped me better connect to my patients, yes. help reassure them, and doctor will spend a time and attention to be with them 100%. And that's really helped uh, our patients to calm themselves down and get the best surgical results. Absolutely. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you for joining us. We've got to go, but we say goodbye and God bless you. Log on to www.ctntv.org where you can make a prayer request, view our program guide, see who's on bridges, or even watch one of Monica's latest teachings. Log on to www.ctntv.org. For more information on a guest, visit our website, ctntv.org. Prayer changes things. If you need prayer, write to the address on the screen. Call 615-754-0039 or email prayer at ctntv.org. If you would like to contact WHTN, you can write to the address on the screen or call us at 615-754-0039 or visit us on the web at www.ctntv.org.